sort of out there. Yes, it is unfortunately behind a payroll. Yeah, paywall. It's not. I mm. hope you got on a pay payroll. So <laughs> no. And, <laughs> and and we'll start the chit chat um, with you can fill us in on uh, Vic uh, Biocon. Vic Biocon. Yeah. Yeah. And and apart from just talking about what you thought was good there, I want I want to talk generally about what why something like Vic Biocon is necessary and all the other mm. similar kind of conferences. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so we just wait. Usually on a Monday, people are flooding in, but they haven't started yet. Um, we're now going to Instagram too. We can stream to Instagram now as well. Yeah, cool. That's, that's new since. Uh, is it was it, was it last year that that I was doing helping with Vic Biocon, or was it the year before? No, it must have been the year before. Last year was it? in person. Yeah, you helped yeah. out in the year that was online, so it must yeah, have been twenty twenty two. Well, someone's jumped in from X. That's very good. Oh, and here they come. And another one from X, which I can't stop calling Twitter. It will always... Oh, yeah. No, that's always Twitter. Yeah, it's always going to be Twitter to me. Uh, did you get to many of the uh, many of the sessions apart from your own? Um, yeah, I did. There, there was a... The first day actually had four sessions running at once which is more than um, they've had before. So I felt like I missed a little bit on the first day. Yeah, that always sucks, doesn't it? it well, even when they yeah. run two, the, it uh -huh. always ends up that there'll be the two that you are interested <laughs> in running at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it felt like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how, where are you at in terms of um, the academic progression now? Yeah, so I submitted my PhD in December, just before Christmas, yeah. Yeah. Um, which was awesome. Um, so it's still under examination at the moment. Um, that can take somewhere between like three to six months, depending on how quickly your reviewers work. Or... And so, does, La yeah. have a, does La Trobe have a process where you have to defend it? Like no, public, you don't have to do that in defense. Australia. No. So you'll get um, reports back from the examiners and they'll probably ask you to change some stuff and then you make the changes, yep. submit it back to the uni and then you're done. Yep. Yep. So that, that process only happens once? Like you get one round yes. of corrections? Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Mm. Wow, they're a bit slow coming in today. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Maybe because I changed to Tuesdays for a few weeks and then came back to Monday. So. And are you working at uni at uni now? I I'm at La Trobe today, but yeah. um, I'm not currently working for La Trobe. No. Okay, is that on the? Is that sort of on the cards? Like, what's your? Um, like um, I'm going to be working. I'm going to be working for RMIT. Oh, okay, so um, I, that's where Kylie is, isn't it now? So, uh, Kylie Kylie Stones is at the University yeah, of yeah, Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, who, who's at RMIT that I always read? Um, uh, Holly Kirk. Oh, Ho Holly. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Holly, of course. <clears throat> she sends up with like connectivity in urban areas for birds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably the only person who would be in the birdie category. Okay, well, yeah, all of the urban ecology stuff that I, yes. I'm, I'm usually reading. And are you, oh, look at look at him go. Where is he? What are you eating? He loves cables and he loves the, the top oh, of the head. Dangerous. Loves the, the top of the headphones. Uh, it goes wild on that. But yeah, are you all right? Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> where was I? Lost my train of thought on that. Yeah, so we'll... Uh, what role will you be doing there? Will you be doing like some uh, more postdoc research or will you be um, yeah. teaching or tutoring? No, no, probably not teaching. Um, it, it's probably just going to be all research. So helping out on existing projects. Um, okay. It's not really like a formal 
postdoc where I have my own project. But yeah, hopefully working towards that um, cool. in the future. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we we need it. Ah, oh, here they're starting to come in. Hello, YouTube. Um, we'll be getting going very shortly. Uh, just waiting for the notifications to filter out. I'm always worried when the Facebooks haven't um, uh, haven't come in. There's been glitches with Facebook recently, so but I've got no warning yeah, okay. here. Apparently, we're out there, so we'll just mm -hmm. give it a, give it another minute or two. Now, have you got a hard a hard out time today? Like, do, um, you to, do you need to get lost at um, a particular time? Oh, like what one thirty would okay. would be good. Okay. Just because I'm helping to pack up, we're in the process of moving buildings at Latrobe Uni, so I'm helping to pack up some stuff here today. I went to Latrobe for a year and a half, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I was in the I was doing uh, English at that time. Okay, so I never went uh, to this anywhere near the science stuff because it was all over towards the. Towards the back car park, it was back there. Yes, it was, yes, it that's was where like we are. Just, <laughs> it was like barren. It was there was nothing out there beyond the building, and so we never went yep. there. I and I was living in college too, so at, for yeah, part okay. of the time I was there. So just walked across the moat into the uh, <laughs> union building, uh, hung yep. around uh, over to the library, and then back to college. <laughs> yeah. That was it. Oh, I know. Well, the, the like the building, the building that we're in here, biological sciences, has been largely unchanged since it was built in 1967. Well, I think so. It desperately still just needs that, uh, brown. Yeah, yeah. There's a brown, lot brown a bricks lot with those horrible uh, stairways. <laughs> yes, awful, exactly. Awful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it, it um, definitely needs a bit of a reno. Yeah, and used to go over to the flats because that was where all the action is. Back when I was there. flats. Yeah, um, across the so at the at the sort of the entrance to that union building. Uh, yeah. So there was the the colleges on one side, right? Or yep. You know, like Chisholm College, and then mm -hmm. union building, and across from the union building, there was just massive car park. There was nothing else. It was just all car park, and then across the road. So is it? It's not plenty road there. Um, oh, the, it's Kingsbury the Drive. K Kingsbury Drive, or is that on the yeah. other end? Anyway, where, wherever the entrance was on that side, just across the road, was flats, residential flats, which was yeah, where, yeah, yeah. where people would live. So, I mean, that was the extent of my experience. Library, <laughs> union building, arts, uh, and then over to the, over to the flats. So, you missed yeah. the wildlife sanctuary, Grant. Uh, no, well, it, it's funny because at that stage of my life, like I'd been a bird nerd all my life, but then um, when I went to uni, my first year at uni, I got into rock and roll and yeah. consequently got excluded from Monash University with the, oh, no. with the worst ever mark for someone who completed every assignment and did both of the exams in microeconomics 101 apparently my uh, that that's what my um my lecturer said with uh a a, a combination of disdain and pleasure uh as he was talking to the disciplinary board and um they're horrible things too going to those academic uh, progress I, I, I don't recommend that to anyone but hey I did it <laughs> and anyway I had to go and do academic rehabilitation therefore I enrolled at La Trobe uh, and moved from economics and politics to do English Lit which I really yep. enjoyed but because I'd been struck by the rock and roll bug I only look what did I do I, I picked uh what was it? Cinema appreciation. I did some Shakespeare, and I did, I think, modern Australian, modern Australian uh, literature, and then a poetry unit. <laughs> but by then, I was done with uh, with being academic for a number of years. I think 
what was it? That was that was 1985, six. So yeah, I left. I I, I left. I, I just gave Latrobe. I just gave Studyway 86, middle of 86, and then I came back in 1993 to do horticulture. And that was oh wow. I, I should have done that right from the start. I should have done biology yes. or horticulture or something right at the start, but I didn't. You get talked into shit by your parents, of course. <laughs> oh no, it'd be much better if you did economics, and then you could consider moving to law. Yeah. And you know, and, and and you like politics, so why don't you do that? You like having <laughs> arguments in politics, and then I, I had no idea I had to do economic statistics. So. <laughs> Anyway, there we go. Oh, here we go. Facebook, Facebook's turned up. Okay, now we can. Now that Facebook's all here, that's good. So now I can press go live on Instagram. Instagram only lets lets that stream go for a, an hour. So there we are. Now we can do that, and now we can um, put the proper music on and the proper stream for when we get. How are you, Naomi, by the way? Nice to see you. Um, all right. When we're, when we're going, when we're getting going, we do this. We put the... This track's called Feeding the Ducks. So we change from Feeding the Ducks to Rock. Bravo. G'day bird nerds, I'm Grant, I'm a bird nerd. It's Monday, Monday means urban <laughs> birds. I'm joined in my studio by, this This one's had an upgrade. This is my avian media uh, advisor, Loz. And of course, in the other studio, which uh, let's get, there we are, over there, 
Um, <laughs> uh, pe- pending Dr. Jacinda Humphrey. Hello. <laughs> hey, Grant. How are you doing? Uh, really great. Hey, it's great to have you on. We talked about having you like on the show on your own for ages and ages, and we had to really <laughs> wait until something got published, and now it's out. So today yeah. we're going we're to have our discussion focused roughly around uh, this, which is uh, Jacinda's la- uh, latest publication, which has um, obviously been accepted and been published. So congratulations for that. And it's Thank titled ha- Housing or Habitat, What Drives Patterns of Avian Species Richness in Urbanised Landscapes? And of course, that carries on really nicely to a whole lot of the discussions that we've had here before with uh, Holly Parsons, of course, and mm. uh, Daryl Jones and Holly Kirk and Kylie Soans and uh, some of the other superstars of uh, urban mm. ecology, uh, conservation ecology in Australia. So this is great. Uh, housekeeping too. There's a little thing down there. You can ask comment. Uh, you can ask questions, make comments, and we'll uh, do this. We will just go. Um, Naomi, I'm great. I'm assuming Jacinda's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Naomi. <laughs> so, let's start with the first principles. What was the problem, or the issue that you wanted to confront when you started the uh, the research for this for this paper, Jacinda? Yeah, so like there's been a lot of research into birds in urban areas. It's by no means a new thing. Um, but what my supervisors and I kept coming across was that people have studied um urban bird communities on kind of like spatial gradients if that makes sense so they might survey birds near the city center and then they might move a little bit further away from the city out into the suburbs and do some more surveys and then go a bit further away again so they're kind of using these long gradients that go for kilometers and kilometers um and they were coming up with sorry could just to make sure that I understand it and everyone else that does. So you pick a central point that might be the the, the post office in the CBD yep. and then you yep. base your uh, survey points on a linear scale based on a distance that is moving away from that central point. Yeah, yeah. And that, that kind of thing has been done in cities all around the world. And they're kind of making an assumption that when we have – more housing development or more buildings, more kind of impervious surfaces, if you like. So that that's including roads and footpaths and anything man-made. When we have more of that, we have less available vegetation. And that's generally the case, but certainly for anyone that's based in Melbourne, you'll know that the, the amount of tree cover that we have in our suburbs varies enormously based on where you are in the city. So we kind of wanted to try and separate those two things to try and see, okay, well, we know that man-made things are having an impact and we know that vegetation or the amount of habitat has an impact. So let's try and separate them and see which one is really the important driving factor and the thing that we need to consider most if we want to try and protect birds in our cities. What I thought was interesting with the the way you've approached it and we'll talk more about that methodology in in a minute but there often seems to be an assumption that there's a real sameness about the value of different categor categorizations of land use like Mm -hmm. like where i live i'm out in the in in the northwestern suburbs and that there's often an uh, an equivocation between the local park at, in my uh, suburb or in my municipality mm-hmm. compared to the local park in somewhere like Lilydale or even somewhere like um, Camberwell. And 
Yep. Having lived in the eastern suburbs, I can tell you parks <clears throat> over there are radically different to what parks yes. over here are. And there might be one park in an established suburb which is large with lots of mature trees. And yep. because just based on area alone, there's there's often an equivocation. Whereas over here in the newer estates, we've got all these odd little triangles and whatnot which might have no mature trees in them yep uh, and and just on on surface area alone they're often equivocated and and your methodology takes takes care of that yeah so we 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 focus quite strongly on big canopy trees so um not necessarily trees that are you know 150 300 years old but just a tall tree that might be growing in your street or your local park, your own backyard. We kind of use that as our measure of the amount of available habitat because it was something that we could easily see from aerial photos of Melbourne. And that's kind of how we we went about quantifying it was um, looking at aerial photographs and then also visiting those places as well. But yeah, as you say, that you can't compare parks in wildly different areas of the city because there's so much that goes into a park in terms of providing habitat for birds and where you are in the northwest it's probably an area that was originally covered by grasslands which is a totally different ecosystem to what would have occurred say in Camberwell or in Lilydale further east where you're in more of a, a dry woodland or heading up into like temperate forest so the and, type of vegetation then... that would have occurred there is so different and then totally different to the Bayside Fringe, like when you're talking yes. uh, Frankston or Edith Vale yeah. or or even coming <laughs> up to Elwood where it would have been dominated by coastal tea tree and yes. a, and coastal wattles as a uh, – and moving into then, you know, maybe maybe a woodland, which is totally different to what happened over here. And, and um, remnant vegetation then is obviously going to be – very, very different. Um, yeah, before exactly. We, before we progress on, I just want to uh, ask you for something, and I, I didn't pick this out of out of the study, but maybe you can give us an, an idea. Did you did you get a sense for if there were any parts of the greater metropolis of Melbourne that have a greater proportion of remnant vegetation? not only trees, but yeah. let, let's maybe talk about uh, vegetation communities than, than others. Like, are, are there any areas which are good for remnant vegetation communities? Let's start with that. Yeah, yeah. So um, there actually has been some research that has looked at that. Um, it has primarily focused on trees because that's generally where the focus is, unfortunately. Um but it happens to be the, the main area that I was surveying in. So kind of the suburbs up in the north and northeast. Um, so what some councils, they might market the, themselves as part of the, the green wedge. Yeah, so the Plenty Valley, like, Nilambic, those yes, kind of places. Yes, so we're talking absolutely. Eltham and and yep. further out. For anyone who, yeah, yeah. who is sort of loosely familiar with, with Melbourne, there was a policy, I think, developed in the late sixties, I think, uh, where that area, when it was opened up for development, there was a trade-off that that Yarra, uh, not Yarra Valley. What's the uh, the Plenty Valley, isn't it? Uh, Plenty was River. going to be uh, basically left as a green wedge where it would mm. only be low density residential housing uh, as a basis that to be developed. That's of course changed, but um, yes, <laughs> but that uh, that was the idea. Okay, so so that part of Melbourne is still pretty good for remnant vegetation yeah. communities. Okay, yeah, there's there's a decent amount of, of vegetation still there, and it it isn't all remnant. Some of it will have been planted in the last say fifty years in particular. Um, yeah, but certainly anywhere like along. The Yarrabirarong cor corridor is fairly well vegetated, and it's it's stuff that's been there for a long time. 
um, and then heading out even further east, so out into the Yarra Ranges Shire, that, that has huge tracts of intact vegetation um, and a lot of it is on private land, which is encouraging because people are keeping it. Well, it's encouraging if they keep it. But yes, it's also, they currently are. But it's also perilous because... You can uh, be. Because what happens is, uh, I mean, we're really going outside the scope of your of, of your uh, of your study. But but what happens is people protect it while they own it, and then they get to yes. fifty or sixty, and they transfer it, they sell it, or they transfer it to other people, uh, maybe in their family, and maybe as a result of that transfer, is that it gets subdivided because they're large properties and they everyone wants to be fair and everything of course and then the yeah. land use is is at peril that can change really quickly um without anyone making any uh, decision that we might go oh they're horrible developers but <laughs> but you are a horrible developer if you subdivide your block and put another house on it that's exactly what you well, do especially if you're clearing trees yeah. and vegetation yeah. to do yeah. it so uh, yeah. Anyway, let's go back. Let, let's go back to that methodology. Uh, so you, <laughs> how did you select where you were going to? Uh, I mean, how, was that process random? Like, how did? How, no, no, certainly not random. So we we decided we were going to stick to the northeastern suburbs to target that area where we know we've got a decent amount of vegetation. Um, and I spent many many months. Um, looking at looking at aerial photos of, of different suburbs and also um, collecting data on the number of houses or the density of houses in, in a lot of these places. Um, so we were actually targeting, we wanted 30 suburbs in total um, and we wanted those suburbs to be spread um, with a range of tree cover. So from as little trees as we could find to a, a as many as we could in um, in the suburb, and then also a range of housing density. So areas that had um, relatively high housing density, so not necessarily places where you've got multi-storey apartment blocks or anything that you might see, say, in Richmond um, or those places really close to the city. Um, still, you know, your standard kind of suburbia, but small blocks, houses close together, maybe some units or duplex developments where you've got two um, properties super close together, all the way out to, you know, large multi-acre properties where it's one house and, you know, plenty of garden attached to that one property. So when we're looking at this, this is one of the figures, uh, figure one, I believe, from <laughs> the uh, from your paper. Those percentages that are on the screen, that's the percentage of vegetation cover that uh, that is there that you're able to determine from the aerial photos is that right yeah i i actually can't see what you're showing but yes that that will oh, be okay you can't you can't see the screen okay i can't no <laughs> sorry um folks can can everyone else see the uh, uh see the picture that i've got up there um let me know because i can see it uh, quite fine let's have a look is uh, <laughs> naomi Amy. can't either uh Naomi doesn't see it either. Um okay. What about now? Nope. What about now? That's really, really weird. Um <laughs> Okay, let me remove that is really weird. It's showing beautifully on my uh on my thing. Okay. Well let's um what about if we go to here? And we do that. Can we see it now, folks? Naomi, anyone else? Uh, no. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I'm just going to remove that completely and we'll <laughs> just keep going. T keep telling me about it and I'll, I'll try and bring it up again and we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, so what you would have been looking at are some examples of the different suburbs I visited um, showing the amount of tree cover. Yeah, that's it. I can see okay. it now. How weird. It was exactly the same <laughs> for me before. Okay, so let's uh, let's put that in the full screen and um, 
show. So, yes, um, just to recap. So there's Melbourne. There's the dots of Melbourne, where the survey sites were. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the different types of, ha of uh, peri-urban, suburban, urban. And there we are. There's some mm -hmm. representations of what they look like on the urban uh, on the aerial photos. Okay. Yes. Great. <laughs> yeah, so I had three, the, the peri-urban, the suburban and the urban were the names that we gave different categories of um, housing density. So peri-urban are the ones that are generally out around the urban fringe of Melbourne, so further from the city with lower housing density or, or larger block sizes, if you prefer. Um, the suburban one's kind of your your typical suburb where a lot of people in Melbourne have probably grown up. And then urban is more high density. So that's where you've got really small blocks. The houses are very close together. Um, they might even be building fence to fence in some cases so that there's not a lot of garden happening, just a lot of people living in close proximity. So what was and the... What was the determining factor? Like, how did you select? Because I'm looking at, and, and the the figure shows that we've got a peri-urban uh, grouping, but one's got 24% vegetation cover, one's got 63. And mm -hmm. on the other extreme, we've got urban, and one's got 13%, one's got 37. Now, 37 mm -hmm. is more than 24%. So what was the... I mean, where where did you draw the line between something being urban and suburban? What were the characteristics that you had to check off to make the which, which the decision about which basket you put yeah. the, the site in? So those categories, um, we we ignored the tree cover completely, and for the. The, the categories you can see on the screen, it, it all came down to the number of houses that occurred within that area. Um, now, so anything it, it, classified as, yeah. It, it Does house also mean shop, warehouse, yes. bus shelter? Not bus shelter. Um, okay. But at any building that has an address. But okay. I was right. mainly... Like, I was trying to avoid anywhere that had shops or um, other types of buildings that weren't residential houses. We were really trying to go for a hundred percent homes. Okay, residential red, um, dwellings. So points. something, something yes. someone can live in. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the 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 high density one, urban, would have a minimum of one thousand residential dwellings in that area so it had to be had to reach that minimum to fall in that category whereas your peri-urban one oh you're testing my memory grant but it's significantly less houses i'm pretty sure it was less than 250 off the top of my head could have been less than 200 now i know we're getting right in the weeds but this is something i wrote down on my whiteboard while i was while i was reading this how how about an area like Campbellfield or the mm. the back blocks of Laverton where nearly all of the buildings are like those big distribution centers or or mechanics workshops and places like that they're not residential dwellings how did you treat no. those areas or did you just exclude just, them we didn't we didn't go there yeah okay. we we were only targeting areas that people lived in Okay, so if it cool. was really commercial or anything, that w it was ruled out. Okay, so that so that's the significant parameter of the uh, of of yeah. the study. So um, cool, great. So um, let's go back. I've got to go back to the article, don't I, to go through there. <laughs> so um, so when you've once you've selected it, and mm -hmm. you. You're looking at aerial photos. The next thing I, I, I always look for what could possibly be a problem. Uh, are, are, were all the aerial photographs from a comparable time period or were some of them from 2008 and some were from 2018? Yeah, so all the photos were captured in December of 2018. So it all happened within 
that they don't give you an exact date, but like we know they yeah. were all within yeah. the same month. Yeah. Um, so yes, they they were certainly current at the time that I was doing the field work. Right. I'm sure there's been change since then though. Great. All right. So how did you so this is the, the next question. You've selected the areas and mm -hmm. and you've got a determination about what the density or the the proportion of um uh, of built structures yep does that include uh where you are roads and and paving and things like that or or is that too granular so we we did calculate both from looking at the aerial photos so the area covered by just buildings and then the area of like basically anything man-made so that's your buildings your roads your footpaths if there happen to be a car park somewhere all of those kind of hard surfaces um but they're they're really strongly correlated with each other so if you have lots of houses you're also going to have lots of everything else all the roads and the car parks that if they kind of come together as a package deal cool so were there problems in determining uh that like how, how difficult is it to uh to determine what is the percentage of paving or roads yeah or, um yeah it, or, um... or, or backyard paving that's the the other thing and car parks so like landscape hard surfaces rather than utilitarian roadways and things like that did did you have a problem uh nutting out how you were going to apply that consistent formula yeah definitely that's something that we we talked about for a long time was trying to find the best way to do that and originally we wanted to use some fancy technology and try and get ai involved to auto detect um things that appeared to be roads or appeared to be the roofs of houses but it was um it was really complicated and it also, of course, coincided with uh, the first lockdown for the COVID pandemic that a lot of this was happening. So it was a challenging time. Um, so what I ended up doing is over each of my photos, um, aerial photos, I overlaid a grid of points. So there were um, a minimum of 200 points on each photo. And then for each of those little points, I would zoom right in to the best resolution I could. And I would be recording what that point was on top of. So it could have been on top of a road, on top of a house. Maybe it's on top of a tree or someone's garden. Um, and I did that systematically for the 200 points. And then we use that as kind of an estimate. So it's certainly not a perfect measure, yeah. but it's giving us a good idea. Yeah, so it was consistent, so that you maybe looked at a uh, a, a fifty square meter um, uh, spot over a, a, a consistent number of places in each survey site to pull yeah. back to get that percentage. Okay, so yeah, excellent. So, how much fun was it doing the bird surveys? Well, the bird surveys were great, uh, apart from a couple of very, very cold mornings. They they were really good. So I, I did uh, 1,500 bird surveys. So I had 300 sites and I visited each of those sites five times um, over the space of about a year and a half. And I'd spend, yeah, 10 minutes at each site where I'd record any birds that I could see or hear within the surrounding area. Um, and I just did that again and again and again. Now, of, of course, getting right down into into the weeds again, um, it, is there a significant sort of difference in terms of evaluating the quality of that data um, because of the time frame and mm -hmm. because that birds do different things at different times in each year? So is that, yeah. is that something which is possibly significant or that you just don't think is, is really significant and didn't take it into, uh, into account? 
Yeah, so we we had survey, like a specific survey period. So one that was kind of the non-breeding season, which happened okay. in autumn and winter, and then one in the breeding season, which was um, predominantly spring. I went a couple of weeks into the start of summer. Um, yeah, so we were aware that, you know, that there are a lot of birds that are moving around the landscape and might only turn up in particular months of the year or obviously their behaviours are changing throughout the year and they might be more or less easy to see or hear. Um, so, yes, we did spread them out and made sure that I had um, at least two visits in the non-breeding time and then I had three visits in the breeding time. And, of course, you, you tried to make it even more even, uh, 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 a, be a better uh, uh, survey to compare because y you basically said bad weather, don't do a survey. So, yep. <laughs> yep. So you tried <clears throat> as much as possible to go out in, uh, in conditions that were uh, meteorolo meteorologically sa same within a within a, a exactly a, a tolerance and at the same yeah time. yeah so that's really hard isn't it like uh, you're at risk mm -hmm. of of you know it's not difficult in Melbourne to perhaps get ten days in a row that don't meet your uh, don't meet your your conditions. And yeah. that then puts at risk the quality of the data, doesn't it? Yeah, so I had to be really strict about the weather conditions. So as soon as it started raining, I would have to stop and then I'd have to come back to that spot, you know, the next day. Um, and then the same for, for wind. So I actually carried a little handheld weather meter with me into the field and if if I got above the wind threshold, I'd have to stop. Yeah. Yep. Because that that can affect whether the birds are calling or whether you can hear them as well if the wind is quite loud. Um, so yeah, I was really strict on it, and then I just had to hope that I had enough days to get everything done. And thankfully, it, it worked out all right. So, what did um, I'm, I'm just going to sort of skip through some of the headings and make sure we don't pass over anything. Um, that's really important because yeah. in some of these sites, no doubt there were things like you've got measures of human disturbance. That could be somebody building a new Bunnings Absolutely. warehouse or, or widening a road or, yep. you know, some other, you know, new development, lots of um, street scrapes being altered or something. So did, mm -hmm. did you come across uh, many things where you had to maybe discount or assume something because of disturbance? Yeah, so noise disturbance is a big issue when you're surveying in urban areas. There's always some kind of noise going on, whether it's cars or, as you say, construction sites were a constant issue. There, There's people building houses everywhere. Um, and in those cases, I would certainly make a note that there's been ongoing noise throughout a survey and if it if I decided you know just arbitrarily this is too loud um I would kind of stop and wait for a break in the noise so something that I would often wait for is is lawn mowers if people were out mowing their lawn I'd kind of be like okay he's probably almost done I'll just I'll give him a couple of minutes and then leaf, hopefully I can hear things leaf blowers <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. They should be outlawed. Bloody leaf <laughs> Um Now, I, I know we're going to be constrained by by time, so um, tell me what you what you what what's what's the important thing that you discovered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what. Do you, I mean, basically your conclusions, but yeah, and and what surprised you along the way getting to your conclusions? Yeah, so I guess um, the biggest takeaway from this part of my PhD was that 
the thing that appears to be influencing birds the most actually isn't tree cover. It's the housing cover or the housing density. That seems to be the real driving factor um, for how many different bird species turned up in a suburb. It, it all came down to, well, how many houses are there? Um, and that was a little bit surprising. Like people have obviously found similar results saying that, oh, urban development is having a big impact on birds. But we kind of thought that trees might be more important. Um, so I guess, so, yeah, that, that was a surprise. Okay. So this is a really important thing, I think, out of out of the whole paper. And, and this is the where, where I think the crux of what people can take from your research is. And I think... Have we been have we been doing studies in the past, do you think, that are kind of faulty in a way because we've all been vegetation centric and because as a community, uh, so I'm I'm getting out into sociology and, and politics <laughs> and economics here as well, we don't want to just admit that what we want to do and that what we have been doing is the really bad thing and that we can all make yep. ourselves feel better by talking about planting trees and and talking about community works in parks. And, I mean, it's to me, it's kind of why Greening Australia was a Trojan horse in a, it, in a, way, in a way that it was always presented by the Howard government um, mm. that we can we can keep doing what we're doing, i.e. large extensions to our houses, buying a renovator's delight and tripling the 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 roof area, and then putting in mm. paving in the backyard <laughs> and, and doing all this stuff. But as long as we plant three gum trees, everything's fine. So. Did you, yeah. Have you kind of exploded that myth with this work? <laughs> I don't know if I've exploded that myth, but I it's definitely an issue that the people think, oh, yeah, as long as we plant trees, it'll be fine. And certainly some of the later work that I did in my PhD has suggested that like trees are still important for particular species or particular types of species. Um, but if... Like we look at the whole bird community, yeah, they're just being out outshadowed by housing and everything that comes along with housing. So definitely if if people are extending their homes or knocking it down and building three units, it, it, it all takes away valuable space in an urban area. If you've got more and more house, there's just less land for gardens and for, for any other type of land use. And for most of our native birds, a house doesn't represent any kind of valuable habitat. Like some um, introduced species might hang out on your roof or even in your gutters, but it's pretty rare for a native bird to be using that as actual habitat, and that's that's the big issue. So is were you able to determine what's worse like and, and I always like to talk about my street because my street mm -hmm. is really indicative <laughs> of what's happening everywhere is that it was three bedroom brick veneer houses uh, mm -hmm. largely built in the um, 70s some of them a little bit earlier some of them 80s and 90s but most of them yep. in that sort of the 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 children of of Post World War Two migrants were the people who were building out here. That's the way the development happened. Yeah. And now every time a property is sold, the garden is completely raised by some yep. guy with a uh, with a with either a dingo or a um, bobcat. Yeah. Or everything is knocked down. Everything is completely knocked down. So you get a three-bedroom place, which is situated pretty much two-thirds or three-quarters of the way up the front of the block. There's a big black backyard. 
that, that they just get knocked down and then mm -hmm. it's three, four, five townhouses or something whacked in. Yep. There's virtually no uh, backyard. It's all hard surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, it, were you able to determine whether there is um, – uh, where, where it's more, what's more bad? Like whether whether building a bigger house and leaving two trees is worse than maybe building a multi-dwelling thing with a central courtyard and new gardens and maybe a nice garden out the front. Like it is there? Were you were you able to see anything that's better in terms of development since? Developments not developments not going away. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's definitely not going away. And I think the better option probably comes down to what scale you're looking at. So if you're looking at an individual street, um, basically anything that takes up more of the block with house or your driveway or some kind of pavers, like that, that's all having a detrimental impact on the number of bird species that might be occurring there. But at the same time, if, if we want to be setting aside patches of remnant habitat to protect them into the future, we might need some of these higher density areas because people have to live somewhere and it can't be low density as far as the eye can see because then we are going to lose a lot of that existing remnant vegetation so that there's always trade-offs, which is the challenge here, because we kind of we want both, but we can't have both. Uh, who who can fix it? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I, I I know this is a really diff difficult discussion, but there's people who make decisions at all steps along the way in, in this. Mm reduction of biodiversity <laughs> in the urban space and once you've scrambled the egg it like it it's all it, it's impossible to repair isn't it and i think we, we'll get to the point that when you do try and repair it the the avian species that benefit and not necessarily the ones that we would all like to benefit, but we'll jump there in a minute. Mm. But what, <laughs> what I wanted to get your opinion on, based on the, you know, you've had a really granular look at so many pl places in in one city, like right mm. down to being able to see different paving stones in someone's <laughs> backyard, I would imagine. You've gone in that yeah. close. So who who should be making the decisions to arrest the decline? Because that's where I think we we have to start, not in trying to repair it, but in trying to arrest the decline. Yeah. Is the responsibility on the people who draw up the pl the larger landscape land land use planning documents and the mm. uh, and those treatments? Is it the people who actually do the technical work to draw up developments or the coming down a step, the the people in that same profession who are drawing up plans for individual uh, addresses? Yeah. Or do we just try and shunt it over to the people in nurseries and homeowners and people who are trotting up to Bunnings each afternoon. Like where, where can we make the most difference in addressing yeah. the decline, not in fixing it, but in addressing the decline? Yeah, so I think um, definitely any organisation that's doing a new development, so, what, yeah, whether they're developers, maybe they're landscape architects, people working in that space where they're like, we're going to put a hundred new houses here. Those people are really, really important to get the message to, to say, before you start thinking about your subdivision, let's look at what habitat remains on this site. Let's look at what habitat 
is in close proximity. So maybe we can think about improving the connectivity for, for birds and for other wildlife um, and just trying to change their attitudes so that it's not just come in and clear everything and then put in 100 homes in close proximity, trying to, yeah, protect whatever is there and then think about incorporating more of it into their build. So whether that's having more like small parks throughout the development and actually properly vegetating those parks so that it's not just lawn um, and your, your street trees. So I guess that links in with your local council and what some of the planning um, schemes are or, or planning permits for different areas, what you're allowed to do. I do think local councils can do more um, with blocking like inappropriate redevelopments or thinking more about, yeah, how they manage their parklands and their street trees and that to to do everything they can. So but it needs a lot of different of, people. But there's kind of something contradictory and it. it goes back to what I mentioned back at the start about my locality. My locality has mm. got no shortage of small parks in every new development, but none of them are joined to anything else. Yeah. So, so what you end <laughs> up with is really reflective of what you what you got in your bird community, and we'll talk about that. The birds that are present. There's magpies mm. around. There's noisy miners around. There's red yep. wattle birds around. There's spotted doves. There's common miners. There's blackbirds. You got there's mm. sparrows. We got no finches. I actually, mm. I, actually, I lie. We do have uh, goldfinches, apparently, uh, uh, oh, sometimes. Yeah. And occasionally I've seen, I think, three times in 14 years, I've seen green finches here. But I'm not, I've yep. never seen a red browed uh, firetail, which mm. really should be around here. I've never, yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, I haven't seen a fairy wren for 12 years. I haven't yeah. seen an eastern yellow robin. Um, yep. These are all birds that if I lived the same distance from the city on the other side of town, I'd probably find in a garden, in a average average size block, you know, and, and I think you've probably got a better than 30% chance of, of, finding, of finding those birds. So councils have all got strategies, but they don't force anyone to do anything. Like No, they don't. And they don't force um, yeah, people so that, to stop doing things. So. Yeah. They they all have, um, or they're in the process of developing things like urban forest strategies and biodiversity management plans. Um, that seems to be all the rage at the moment with councils, which is which is good to see. But, yeah, as you say, it's not legislated, so they can't enforce it in any way. It's just their kind of guidelines or their proposal for the coming five to ten years. Um so yeah, that that would involve <clears throat> state, sorry, state or federal government changing what is legal when it comes to new developments. Um, so one thing that they could potentially look at is saying X percentage of your block has to be garden. So you can't just build fence to fence and pave your whole little outdoor courtyard because then the whole thing is man-made surfaces. Um, and but I that, think that would be really valuable. But but that yeah. I, 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 sorry, but I have I have to get on that because if we if we worded it like that, that would mean someone could come in and take every existing tree off yep. off a block, build the structure they want, and then put in one of those roll out succulent roof type you know, that are really popular in the UK so that the whole of the roof is covered in vegetation and they go, there we go, I've done it. But it hasn't added anything at all. It hasn't added one thing and yeah. all it's done is is it, it's a negative because those mature trees or those uh, large shrubs are gone. But vegetation yeah. is still there. So, um, but that... Yeah, that, and that's that, where things like... Um some councils have a significant tree register where there are particular trees that cannot be touched. Mm. Obviously those are generally 
you know, really old river red gums, for example. Um, it's certainly not including things like large mature shrubs at this stage, but maybe they could head down that path and say yeah. we're, we're going to include any kind of mature vegetation. And and even vegetation of a particular height. Like, I mean, that's where, yep. um, uh, where I've always come back to when I'm talking about this with, with Holly Parsons is um, I don't think there's any significant trees in my... Uh, no. From the well understood and horticultural perspective, they're not historically important. They're not from a, yep. they weren't put there by the first explorers, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, the most significant trees in my area were planted as street trees or in yep. the, the, the edges of a park, but, but they're, they're not local species in most cases. Mm. And, they're not historically significant because the queen didn't plant them or a <laughs> Lord Mayor didn't plant them and there's no plaque, if you get what I mean. Yeah. So there's nothing nothing to stop anyone coming in and going, we're going to replace them, but what we're going to do is we're going to replace all of these non-Indigenous eucalypts and we're going to replace them with 25,000 Indigenous plants, but they're all tube stock, right? Yeah. So yeah, so you're looking but, at decades. Depending on how things valuable. are written, that would be ticked off as a great success. While while continuing yeah. the decline of biodiversity, uh, it, it anyway. I've I've gone off. Tell us about the birds that are the winners and the birds that are the losers. Yeah, across um, across your study area. Yeah, so there definitely were some clear winners and losers are so some of the species that you were mentioning earlier which you can also see on screen things like magpies and miners they're they're birds that we we all have in our gardens really it doesn't matter where you live in melbourne you've probably got magpies noisy miners common miners um they they tend to be you know larger larger bodied birds potentially more aggressive species um and they're just they're doing so well in urban environments that they, they easily find all of their resources. Whereas um, species that were typically dependent on forests and woodland habitats, those guys are in big trouble. They're the ones that we are losing from suburbs everywhere. Um, and we believe that that is because they, they need those remnant patches of bushland that are just becoming rarer and rarer across our city. And and to summarise that, you, over the survey areas, mm -hmm. you found 76 bird species, but yep. 10 of those, <laughs> so what are we looking at, about 15% uh, of, of the total amount were only found in one place. So that, that's, that's right, yep. isn't it? That, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so they only turned up in one of the 30 suburbs. Yeah. And yes, yeah, some of them were aquatic birds. So obviously their occurrence is going to be very tied to where you've got waterways or, or some other kind of freshwater habitat. But yeah, a lot of them were forest birds where they really need the, the bushland areas. So where you found a higher percentage of those bird species occurring, what was, mm -hmm. what was common? to it to the to those sites yeah so they they were all areas that tended to have lower housing density um so fewer homes and more tree cover so it was the best of both worlds really for them so places like um if people are familiar with melbourne places like mount evelyn hurstbridge Wattle glen these are kind of fringe suburbs where there's still a decent amount of native vegetation. Um, in some cases it is protected. It, it's um, where I was in Mount Evelyn was right near a national park area. Um, but also a lot of it is on private property in these areas as well. So was there anywhere good? Oh, oh. anywhere well, good. <laughs> yeah. At, like in the, uh, I was going to say anywhere good in the Western suburbs, but Loz taking flight um, 
disturb me. So I need to <laughs> just uh, you just carry on. I'm just going to bend down and put Loz on his playpen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't visit any of the western suburbs. We because we chose to restrict my study to the northeast um, to try and keep, I guess the things a bit more consistent in terms of the type of vegetation and the type of birds that might occur there. Um, but I yeah, the, the I, West I should have mentioned, be a whole different story. Yeah, I should have mentioned that let's let's step outside the bounds of, of the study for a minute. In your yeah. experience of Melbourne, is there anywhere good in the West? Like, like In the West? Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Apart, um, from, apart from the Botanic Gardens at Footscray. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I, I would be thinking anywhere along um, a waterway. So whether there's decently vegetated areas of like the Maribyrnong or something like that, like that, that's where you're often getting more bird species turning up is moving along riparian areas, provided there is vegetation there and it's not just cleared. So let's... I'm going to read the I'm, I'm going to read the uh, the the paragraph here, and if you can mm. decode that for us, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's very the statistically. Best, yeah, the best performing <laughs> models for native species, including measures of human inf infrastructure, meaning housing, and yes. landscape context. Uh, mm -hmm. The final model explained eighty eighty two percent of the variation in native species richness. There was strong evidence for a negative effect of housing cover on native species richness at the landscape scale. Mm. <clears throat> so what that means is um, the amount of housing cover within a suburb was explained 82% of the variation in the number of birds that I recorded there. So there's a really strong relationship between the amount of housing cover and the number of different native bird species within a suburb. So where does that leave us, do you think, moving forward when all of the political momentum and I think the societal feeling is that we need to improve, we need to increase the amount of medium and high density mm. housing in an effort yep. to to stop the suburban sprawl, the creep yep. into areas that are, you know, currently either no density or or low density or low, in terms yep. of human dwellings, in terms of do, mm. uh, domestic dwellings. How? How do we get those two sort of concepts together? Because I think everyone sort of accepts, oh, yeah, we need to go for medium and high-density housing and that will be good, whereas your results seem to say, no, that would not be good. Yes. Uh, and th there's, there just seems to be uh, a paradoxical relationship that we're not really going to be able to uh to solve um yeah so that's it's the trade-off that i mentioned earlier the fact that we can have areas of high density housing which in a way is good because it means that we are theoretically reducing the urban sprawl and reducing the amount of space that we take up within a city but we, we're going to need to accept that within that area of high density housing, we will lose bird species and most likely other native species as well uh, from other types of animals. That, that That's just a given because as soon as we have more houses, there's less available habitat for them to use. So I guess in my view, we need, we need a combination. We, we need areas that are high density housing, absolutely. Because <clears throat> we don't want our city to continue spreading everywhere across Southern Victoria. Um, and we just have to accept that those spaces aren't going to be as biodiverse as areas that have low to no housing. Um, 
but if we can kind of strategically think about where they can go. So we want to be positioning the, those high density suburbs away from any existing patches of vegetation to reduce disturbance as much as possible. Um, and that way we're hopefully getting, I guess, the best of both worlds. Do you think the results of your study are able to be applied to regional cities, large towns, other capital cities? Uh, like, do you think that uh, we can apply this generally in an Australian context or does a, a tropical or an arid city, do you think, would it be significantly different or just, or just mm. differ around the margins? And have similar studies, I mean, to your knowledge, overseas, like maybe in a North American mm. or a uh, European or South American context, have they been done and found similar things? So I, I definitely think that the findings can be applied to other major towns and cities in Australia. We will see variation, obviously, in the, the bird community <clears throat> and also as you say, if if it's a more arid environment or it's like a subtropical city like Cairns, you're going to have huge variation in the type of vegetation there and potentially in um, the amount of remnant vegetation that's still intact. So th there's always going to be changes, but I, I do think that it, it is applicable um, more broadly to Australia. And in terms of overseas, there, there has been a fair bit of work done in Europe and North America. But as I said at the beginning, uh, a lot of that has just really focused on, you know, w one aspect of this big complex environment. <clears throat> so either focusing on the man-made stuff or on the natural habitat. They haven't really tried to dissect the two um, in the way that I did in my PhD. So they are seeing similar relationships, but they're they're not necessarily separating them, which I think we we need to do more of because, yeah, both of them are going to vary in different ways. So if if you were able to be the policy maker and the enforcer for urban development in, you know, let, yeah. let, let, let's make you the urban development czar. Isn't that what they always, isn't that the word they always say? He's the planning czar know. or the urban development czar of the, of the government or something. Um, what, what would you do? Yeah. So I, I would be Kick, looking at uh, a map of uh, Melbourne uh, and saying, okay, where are the current remnant patches of habitat? And kind of drawing a buffer zone around that and saying there's no more development within a certain distance of that patch because that is a really critical resource for birds and for other wildlife and we don't want to be increasing the, the threats and the disturbance that they're experiencing and then saying, okay, well, if we're protecting those, these other areas that are far enough away, they're the areas where we can have more development and high high density stuff to try so, and provide more housing. So King slash Queen Jacinta, um, how far is that measure uh, away? Well, that's from, the question. Yeah, well, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make it harder for you in a minute. So, but if <laughs> if you were to pick. A, a distance, a linear distance from that point, what would it be? I honestly don't know. Like that comes down to how far, how far the, the birds or the other species can disperse. Um, so something like a sulfur-crested cockatoo can fly enormous distances. It's getting around the city, no worries. Whereas some of those birds you mentioned earlier, like a superb fairy wren, they're not necessarily okay. dispersing All that right. far. Good. Good. Well done. Because now, <laughs> because that distance depends on the birds that remain in that place. Okay. Exactly. So yeah. if, it, if it's forest birds and yes. bush birds, 
loosely yeah. called. Yeah. One kilometre might be significant, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So if we drew <clears throat> out every, to one kilometre, this is where you get to be the king and the queen and why I'm going to introduce <laughs> the paradox or the, the, the problem um, mm. and why I wonder whether it's even solvable. So if we said that all of the vegetation, uh, mature vegetation ne needs to be mm -hmm. protected, but we only apply it to golf courses, public parks, uh, uh, council-controlled uh, streets and roadways controlled by Vic Roads. Yep. That's one approach. But don't we really need to say to every landowner, no. No. You want to you want to build a granny flat and take out two eucalypts or two large wattles or mm. banksias? No, you can't. Yep. Would is that what Queen slash King Jacinta would 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 decree? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there there is there's a huge amount of habitat that occurs on private land, and we need to find a way to better protect that. Whether that is enforcing it or likely a combination um, of, you know, m more education and community engagement and more things like um, gardens for wildlife and just changing mindsets about the importance of, of what you already have on your property. Um, and I like to uh, think that that could well, change slightly um, well, with different well, generations. Well, <laughs> So, but here's where we get stuck with the problem, don't we? Because do we enforce it or do we educate? Because personally, I reckon I reckon we've been educated to death, and <laughs> and that people absolutely know that they need to keep vegetation, but they don't. I think some people it, know, but some people like. Are probably not educatable, like they, they don't care. It doesn't occur so, to them as being important. But even if we educate them, and it's the difference between making a a profit, because people, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong, most people tend to buy their property with an eye on not living there forever, but with an, an, an mm. eye on turning it over for a profit, making even if they live there for 10 years, they're, yeah. they're wanting to improve it. They're wanting to put a beautiful patio or whatever out the back. So how do we tell those people who have made that really significant in, investment, probably the mm. biggest one they'll make in their life until they buy their next yeah. property, um, how do we tell them no? This is the... Conundrum. Well, one... One possibility could be something that's currently being looked at for agricultural land in Australia, and that's using something called natural capital. So it's where you actually put, you assign a monetary value to anything natural that is living on your land. And you say, if you have five mature eucalypts on your property, congratulations, your house is now worth X amount of dollars more. So you kind of bring in a system where people are incentivized to keep vegetation because it it's worth money but how but how do they get the money does that mean that every that every non non homeowner in the country <laughs> out of their wages pays that person a bonus for an asset they already have that someone else doesn't have i know i know i'm being really difficult here but this is where <laughs> i think we I just think we continually don't want to confront this really difficult issue because, and, and, and you said natural, right? But significant trees where I live are not natural. Most of them are not indigenous. The significant well, trees that the wildlife use are, in, in, in many cases, are not, not even Australian plants, but they're certainly not yeah. indigenous to here. So... So most of the time we again we, we get hoodwinked a bit because we're all talking about indigenous and uh, 
and and I'm not against it. People know that well and truly. But to make to make development rules, we often use mealy mouth or flexible language, so yeah. that mm. so that stuff gets passed and gets put into into law, like the bylaws or state law. But then yeah. we make it so that it's nearly impossible to enforce. So. Um, yes, and and I know this isn't your problem, but when I make you king and king or queen, uh, Jacinta, how how does someone with your knowledge of what's happening and your that you've just demonstrated that what we're doing now is completely not working? Mm. We 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 are continuing to ex- accelerate the biodiversity loss if we focus on birds. And we can probably mirror that. It's probably worse for reptiles, um, yeah, and and amphibians. In um, so how if if I confer upon you dictatorial powers, how do how do we actually make it make it work? How do yeah. we arrest the decline? I mean, we're never going to stop it. But how do we arrest the rate of decline? Or do we do we just have to, as a community, either accept that we can't be these property flipping, property driven, profit driven community, or do we just have to accept? Oh well, superb fairy ends. Fuck them, you know. I've got magpies. What more do I need? I've got a kookaburra. I've got rainbow lorikeets. Why? Why should I give a shit about you know superb fairy wrens and scarlet robins? Hmm. Yeah. So I, I guess what you're saying is like, how do we get around capitalism, which is well, a massive well, challenge. Well, well, it, it it's not really that broad, but but <laughs> I I speak to so many people who. Are what we would call uh, nature lovers, mm. but if I confront them <laughs> about what they did in their backyard, right? I can be sitting there and I can say, "But look at what you did there." They go, "Oh yeah. well, you know." So, so loving nature is really flexible in terms of if you benefit from what you do, and that's really the conundrum because everybody has that deep seated personal attachment to if it's the home they live in. I'm not even talking yeah. about people who own, you know, two houses and six flats. I'm not even talking yeah. about them. And so how do we make that love of nature and that desire to protect nature stronger than the need to make the house your nest egg for the future something that you mm. value add and by value add i mean put the rumpus room in for the teenagers and the fourth bedroom and the second or third bathroom that you don't actually need yeah because yeah and i that because the roof the the built landscape increases by 20 or 30 percent whenever someone does that mm. It's not 20, 20 or thirty percent of parks are being lost. It's twenty or thirty no. percent of soft landscape is being lost every time someone renovates their house. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's and that's where, like, if you look at the the data on um, <clears throat> canopy trees, a, a lot of the loss does occur on private land. It isn't the council taking out street trees or park trees. It's it's yeah, trees that are in people's backyards and they're in the way of something. I, you're not going to like my answer, Grant, but I, I think that there's a kind of a disconnect. People don't necessarily see their backyards or their local park, their urban area as nature. I think they're kind of like, oh, I like nature. And to them, nature is going for a bushwalk in the Grand I, I, I totally it's love somewhere that. further away. No, I totally love that that answer and that's really why i'm laboring the point because everyone watching this and their parents and their grandparents and their brothers and their sisters when they have knocked down the back of the house and built something new and increased the the uh the the roof area 
of the house by mm. 20 or 30%, mm. you're the problem. And mm. people don't want to don't want to admit that. It we we are living in this fantasy where oh, we can go down the park on the weekend and plant some trees, uh, you know, put on our sunscreen, go out and do something and we're helping biodiversity. And that is just bullshit. And that's what I'm trying to get across. And I'm not saying that those works aren't important. They are important if they're adding or retaining biodiversity. But we're losing mm. it so quickly, every time someone decides to build a rumpus room or a fourth bedroom or a second bathroom, without reducing the living space, you know, they're not trading off existing living space. Yeah. They're yeah. adding roof area. And that's the problem. Yes. So I do love your answer. Yeah. So and that and <laughs> and that is the conundrum we've got. And where I draw it out further across is the disconnect is that we like to blame developers, new developers. The council should be something doing something about street trees. Why isn't the local council doing something in the park? And I say, why the fuck did you build that enormous fucking patio? <laughs> and people never ever want to say anything. They never ever want to say, actually, yeah, that was pretty fucked. I shouldn't have, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have done that. But everyone they know is doing it. And everyone that their exactly. parents did it, they you know, and they pass, everyone wants to pass it on to their kids and all that. And that is the problem. It's not, and it's not a problem of capitalism. It's about a problem of people disconnecting themselves from the problem and you hit the nail on the heads nature is the beach and sherwood mm. for sherbrooke forest and wilson's yep. promontory and what? and the dane tree and kakadu that's nature you know yeah but, but nature is everywhere yeah whereas so do so I'll, I'll, everyone now is your chance because jacinda's got to shoot through really soon <laughs> If you've got a question or a comment, and please be as um, combative or whatever as you like, because I know I'm saying things that people think are bullshit or unkind. Um, but just, you know, I think we first spoke nearly, I think we first came across each other about four, maybe even nearly five years ago, probably four years ago um, mm. that I first reached out um uh, to you and then we did the Vic Biocon thing uh which hopefully we got time to get into um but you're right in this space and you're you're a, you're about to go uh RMIT mm. working with other people working in the field you've worked with uh I think with Kylie Sones you're about to be working with Holly Kirk you've so you're right in this space. Is it is it actually getting better? Like, ah, uh, I know some councils have got policies and stuff, but my local council can't tell me how many native species of birds live in the municipality. Mm. They don't actually have that. They can refer me on to other things, but they yeah. don't know that. They haven't done the study. Um so let's just read, before you answer me or be comment, let's just read what Naomi said. <laughs> Could there be a benefit on every stage of owning or selling a property? If you remove a tree and reduce green space, there is an increase in council rates. Well, oh, no, I'll come back to that. Tax benefits at time of sale, if there is. Why does there need to be a tax benefit? Why do we have to give people more to do the right thing? Um Tax benefits at time of sale if there is retained greenery. Well, we can't even get capital gains tax changed. More expensive and stringent housing development and approval processes. Uh, by the way, Grant, I don't see everyone that owns a uh, as wanting to flip it in ten years. So I didn't say ten years. I think I think my horizon is about thirty years. I think as you get to fifty or sixty, and then your your financial needs change. Um, some want a forever home, and I love your research. Just you know, I love your research too. Uh, we'll just do <laughs> as well. 
Hi, Grant and Jacinda. Wouldn't it be more meaningful for urban and town planning to plan for the environment as a start? Development is un undertaken with a cost in mind. Development around habitat and costs. Um, what would you? What do you think about Naomi's um, point there, Jacinda? Yeah, I guess that's like it's similar to what I was saying with the the concept of natural capital. So it's kind of, yeah, I guess give people a benefit, or uh, you could put it the other way and say if if you buy this home and then when you go to sell it, it's missing the trees that it came with, then you you're going to be taxed an additional amount, or I don't know that money is going to get taken out of the sale or something. Um very very hard to to track though that's like yeah that's the problem you one you've got to devote resources to tracking it and then you have mm. to enforce it um mm. and 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 the other thing we always have this idea of a benefit well what you're taking a benefit you're taking you're taking money from one part of the community including people who don't own property, which is most uh, which is most yeah. renters now. Well, it's renters by definition, but they don't own property. So you're taking money from their uh, from their income and their their overall budget and giving it to people who have an asset. It just seems mm, or are selling it, an asset. Yeah, or, well, it, at first that they own it. So if we're giving them an, a, a benefit to, we're giving them a benefit to just do what's right. We're giving them a benefit mm. to not be bad. That's like saying, right, if you don't shoplift every time you walk into the in, into the store, you get a taxpayer funded voucher of five dollars if you don't pinch something. <laughs> if you don't yeah. kill someone. We will give you a twenty thousand dollar bonus when you turn forty. I'm, I just, I, I, I just think that we we come up with ideas without ever thinking about who pays it or whatever. And what is really needed is we need to be able to stop people doing the thing we know is harmful. We do it with tobacco and vapes and you know seat belts in cars and you can't drive an unroadworthy car. Because it might be harmful for someone, um, but when it comes to their personal property, we can't say no. No, Queen Jacinta has the power. You can put them to death. <laughs> you can put them to death. Well, you'd need, die, you know, you'd um, need so much more investment in people to actually monitor, you know, the the amount of vegetation at different points when properties are bought and sold like it's it'd be a huge job i know i know it's it's like we're so that's why i come back to i mean can we can we win i mean do i mean do we have to actually accept that in in the probably not the peri urban but in the other two capital uh, the other two <laughs> categories because peri-urban, I think, is on the fringe, not necessarily on the outer expanse of the of the city, but it's also there's you know river uh, river mm. valleys and things like that. So it's on the fringe of development. Those peri-urban sites. Um, do we just have to admit defeat and just try to um, try to protect high value conservation areas elsewhere with the dollars that are available? I don't think we admit defeat. Like that's certainly not what I foresee for the next few decades. I I do think that there is a lot of support for biodiversity in cities compared to what there was in the say ten years ago, twenty years ago. I think it's it's a field that is growing and people are becoming more aware of the fact that the nature in their backyard is in fact nature and not just, you know pesky poskin, possums or cockatoos or whatever. Um, so the, I do think there's momentum there, but obviously we still have a long way to go. Um, and a lot of that comes down to having the funding and, and the people to make it happen, to 
you know, if you want to say track change in vegetation cover to enforce um, fines for people that are removing trees on their properties, that's going to need a whole bunch of man hours to do that. And we don't currently have the investment um, to prioritise biodiversity. So that that definitely needs to change. Now, I only want to pick up on one thing you said there so we can draw out another thread. So there's definitely greater awareness of biodiversity in cities and studies being done to assess biodiversity in cities. But is there anywhere, like, I mean, let's take your sample areas. Could you say mm -hmm. that any one of those has greater biodiversity now than it had 30 years ago or 20 years ago? Is there any way to assess well, that? Well, that's... Um... There are some long, like in some places, there there is long term data available for on birds in particular. So whether that's uh, something like bird data, which is managed by BirdLife Australia, yeah, yeah. but the records going back, you know, pr prior to say two thousand, uh, they're not in residential areas. Like so, people weren't doing bird surveys in those spaces. But is it an over the top? statement if i make it that that i i could say that in all of your sampled area it's a fair assumption that the biodiversity in the avian con context and perhaps mm -hmm. mammalian as well mm -hmm. are all they all have less biodiversity than they had 20 years ago or 30 years ago yeah probably um so and no, also just nowhere Nowhere what we do works in terms of arresting biodiversity decline. Is that fair? Um, I think that's probably fair in cities. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the, in the urban been, context. Yeah. I'm not talking about. It hasn't out, been in, the investment yeah, in. Yeah. I don't think yeah. we've properly tried yet. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's, that's a good uh, stepping off point. Um <laughs> Just quickly, uh, if you've got if you've got time, and folks, if you do want to make a comment or ask a question, you have to do it now. Uh, Jacinda, Vic Biocon, you were there last week. Yeah, um, I was. Uh, so that's the Victorian Biodiversity Conference. What yes. kind of people went to that conference, Jacinta? Yeah, so Vic Biocon is a combination of um, students. So people like me who might be doing their honours, their masters or their PhD. Um, and then there's also a whole range of other people. So there's heaps of um, folks working in, you know, some something to do with biodiversity who might not be affiliated with research or universities. So there's lots of consultants who go along um, and people working for different kinds of conservation organisations there's folks who work for local councils who come along as well. So it's a, kind of a big range of people, um, yeah, who are just interested in biodiversity or working in something related to it. Um, and they come along and hear about all different kinds of current research that's being done. And, yeah, it's a really great event. So what were the, what were the significant papers that you saw presented? What did... Uh... In, and let's think about maybe this urban biodiversity yeah. and urban conservation field. What what did you see that was uh, that was be a beauty? Yeah, so there's um there's a student who's based at the University of Melbourne at the moment. Her name's Philippa, and she is particularly looking at plantings on nature strips to try and increase either the diversity or the abundance of both insects and birds which was, I think it's a really, really cool project. So she's working in Marybeck City Council. Um, so what was formerly called Moreland in the, the northern suburbs. And she she went out and did a whole bunch of surveys for, for insects and birds. And then they've gone and kind of ripped up all these um, nature strips and planted them out with Indigenous seedlings. So things that are going to create some form of ground cover or small shrubs. Um, and now she's going back and resurveying them again, which is, um, yeah, super cool to see whether we see any differences 
when it's not just lawn. Vicky's cool. saying something. Sorry, I'll, I'll just put that up in, in, in front of you. I think what I'll do is I'll remove that and then I can put it up and it won't be all over yet. All over you. So Vicky said, hello, Vicky, too, by the way. Um, uh, lovely gang gang mm. there in Vicky's uh, mm -hmm. little, uh, profile pick spot for Facebook. I'm in a flooded area in New South Wales and have around 30 gum trees completing uh, dead, uh, de uh, completing dead uh, due to. I assume completely or, I, I think, dead. I think mean coming, they're completely dead. Okay, so they've died. Mm. Due to sitting in floodwaters, I'm on acreage, mm. acreage and I'm responsible for those trees that they don't fall on neighbours' houses. That's right. You're responsible for making sure there's no economic loss <coughs> to your neighbours and don't fall on neighbours' house and also power lines. Our rule with private electricity poles are no trees within five metres from fence boundary. So a tax on loss of trees would work in all areas. Um, mm. Yeah, well, there's uh, uh, like loss of vegetation for services and stuff is a, is like a another issue with building roads Definitely. and things like that but uh yeah people are responsibility uh, are responsible for what the vegetation on their property may do and in fact vicky that i used to work in landscape contracting uh a lot of people want to take every tree from around their boundary because when it rains a lot or there's really strong winds, those trees might fall on neighbours' fences or cars or houses. So to remove that, mm. that risk to their economic well-being, they remove them. Uh, now, that's a, uh, to me, that's a reasonable decision for people to make. Um, so there's a policy problem there. How do we... How do we retain that vegetation but accept that there might be a risk to neighbours and perhaps build that into the taxation system so that there's a fund <laughs> for that, right? But mm. we don't do that. We say it's all private insurance and everything. So then yeah. that incentivizes people to take away the risk, which is a totally logical decision. Um, the – yeah, and – when we have floods, we have vegetation that dies and that's not going to stop. Same as when we have drought, we have vegetation that dies and that's not going to stop. So we're losing it to natural, to natural forces, but we're not replacing it anywhere else. That's, that's why I keep coming back and harping on about it. And Martin mm. says underground power and... Um, yeah, in new developments, that <laughs> seems quite logical. Um, yes. But there's massive resistance to that in the broader landscape. Um, you know, there's just been that the big hoo-ha with the uh, federal politicians been carrying on about that in the last week or so. Um, big issues in New South Wales and Victoria at the moment about um access to properties and compulsory acquisition mm -hmm. in agricultural uh communities to put uh power lines in now that would be the same whether they're above ground or below ground if they're below ground you still got to get access and you got to dig it up and put it put them in and you still got to have places to maintain them and service them so mm -hmm. yeah um just seen it been great talking to you about everything do you have to rush or can we uh can we take a few more questions have you got time, uh, time oh, a couple more minutes and then i'll have to run okay a couple more minutes well tell me tell <laughs> me more about highlights of vic by icon um yeah and it, is there like is there a direction that the research in the space is heading it, oh good question um, like the, the urban ecology session was fairly broad. So there were also some folks who worked on microbats, um, and were like testing different, um, artificial light at night 
uh, with microbats because that's that seemed to be a threat to nocturnal wildlife. Um, so they had like different uh, different setups with with lights that came on during the night and had a look at how they impacted uh, the microbats that are living within those areas. And that was quite cool. Um, so that's that's definitely I think a growing area of research in the urban space is looking at, at light as a disturbance. Um, what other cool stuff happened? Well, Ky Kylie Soans was amazing because she was presenting on her work with the Floating Wetlands Project um, in the city of Melbourne. So that that was really cool. It's also a project that I work on. Um, it's okay. Um, yeah, so the if people haven't heard of the Floating Wetlands before, they're, it's a project where we have some habitat islands that have been installed in the Yarra River, actually in Melbourne CBD. Um, and they've been put there as a replacement um, kind of means of habitat with they're all planted out with different Indigenous wetland plants um, in the hopes that they'll provide some habitat for mainly aquatic birds, but but really for, for anything that turns up, we accept all, all wildlife. Yeah, and, and, and on that really uh, granular level, I mean, this is where the biodiversity mm. wins are happening, aren't they? Like, like when you can look at, um, you know, 500 square metres of of a particular part of the river where these things are mm. happening, biodiversity is increasing. The, Absolutely. The, yeah. So the so the issue is to extend that that kind of approach and these kind of um, uh, works to much to much much more of the land area of uh, of the uh, the greater metropolitan area. Uh, mm. Yeah, I've got to get got to get Kylie on now that she's back. Are you, <laughs> are, are, you are you in a staff um like uh staff kitchen at, at uni there? I'm not in a staff kitchen. No, I, I am in an office space, but uh, oh, yeah. one that apparently people can access. <laughs> oh, cool! Obviously, that's no drama. Um, <laughs> is there just going back to Vic Biacon and and who and who was presenting and the kind of things people were presenting? It, mm. uh, is there any of the institutions, any of the universities, that is really emerging as the leader in urban ecology or um, with a, a view to conservation ecology in the urban space? Yeah, so um, oh, I guess the the work that's currently occurring is really spread across three different universities. So there's uh, myself and a couple of others who've been studying here at La Trobe. Then there's also some work being done out of the University of Melbourne. So that that's where Kylie Stones is based, but also where the, the Nature Strip project is happening. Um, but really the, the main hub of urban research so not not just ecology but also thinking about landscape architecture and um, urban planning and how they all kind of play in together it, is at RMIT um, which is where I'm going to be working shortly with one of the superstars uh, Holly Kirk <laughs> Holly Kirk uh, yeah, yes uh, um, is, is, Holly, is Holly still in Perth though at the moment she yeah. is, yeah. So yeah. she works remotely. She she yeah. is based over in WA. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cool. Good on uh, uh, good on RMIT for for making that uh, uh, that available. Um, yeah. Well, it's been a long time coming getting you on the uh, on the show. <laughs> I'm really glad we could talk about this, even though I probably interrupted and whatnot so much, so much more than I should have. Uh, I hope it's not so long again. One of the things I found out um, when I was checking out your uh, Google Scholar page is you've yeah. been, you've been a co-author on some other really cool uh, papers. So maybe we might be able to find a a broader discussion to have uh, looking <laughs> at 
birds in the in the urban landscape and see if we can make it a little bit different but equally as um as as interesting if you'd like to um yeah yeah sure last thing i wanted to ask you just going back to this paper uh angie haslam and andrew bennett um were they supervisors or did you have were you yes. work okay and uh, tell us a bit about their sort of focus yeah yeah so both um angie and andrew are landscape ecologists which means that they look at things over really large spatial scales um so rather than what's going on in this one little nature strip they're, they're thinking big picture so what's happening across the entire suburb um and they've done similar types of research to what i did um, in my PhD, but more so in agricultural areas. So this was, I guess my, my PhD was born out of kind of Angie Haslam's work, which, which has looked at birds in agricultural areas of Victoria. And we kind of took some of those same principles and applied them to the city of Melbourne and the residential areas of Melbourne, um, yeah, and Andrew's also done a little bit of a little bit of work on native mammals as well. So he's not solely birds, but um, predominantly a birder. Well, that well, I, I can't let that go. Are you are you wanting to work mainly on birds in the future, or are you? Um, I mean... To be honest, I'm like I think birds are the most logical group um, because they are the most diverse within our cities apart from insects and plants obviously um but I, I i would also be happy to to work on other other types of animals as well as long as it was about you know finding ways to incorporate more habitat for them in in cities and places where people live cool well i really look forward to following your uh, uh your trajectory your academic trajectory <laughs> in the next uh a few years and and see where you go um i think folks that's uh where the question opportunity for jacinta ends jacinta if you need to leave just uh jump out folks i'll keep i'll keep going for a little while if we want to have a cool. uh, discussion that isn't only about jacinta's work uh <laughs> thanks jacinta for for being part of the bird emergency um fitting us in and i look forward to no worries uh, catching up with you again sometime sometime soon doctor cool nearly doctor yeah when, oh, nearly. when when will i be able to call you dr jacinta i honestly don't know um like a, my thesis is under examination so you wait until you get comments back um and then you probably have to make a couple of little changes and then after that that's when you can be called doctor so i imagine it'll be several more months before I get to that stage. Oh, well, maybe maybe around Anzac Day or something like that. We yeah. might be calling you Dr. Jacinta. <laughs> that's, what I, that's, that's what I look forward to because that's uh, the culmination of so many years of um, yes. scraping and scratching and living, uh, living the life and contributing, yeah. and contributing really important work that, then our planners, our decision makers, our policy makers rely on to mm. make good decisions that then affect all of us for the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years. So yeah, uh, that's how important I reckon your work, your work has been here, just in a so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good on your, oh, hang on. Good on you, mate. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so just... D d Jump out whenever you need to, and I'll look forward to um, chatting with you again again soon. Cool. Um, All right. Thanks, Grant. See, see ya. ya. Right. So, folks, if you want to, um, if you want to just have a general chit chat uh, now, that's fine. I'm going to um, sit here with Loz for a uh, few minutes. It's really quite hot here in Melbourne today. And in the studio slash bedroom, uh, I've shut the window because it's really hot out there. But it's now really hot in here. Um, but hey, 
free for all now. It's free for all. So if you're on X, Twitter, jump in, say something. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, jump in. Tell me what you thought of Jacinta's um, uh, discussion and uh, I should have asked her. I've got a copy of this uh, because it's not actually available to everyone who just goes to... Oh, actually, it is. Here we are. Open open access. Um, open access. Um, oh, I've got a funny feeling. I've got a funny feeling that we were uh, talking about uh, no, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, anything else you anything else you want to say? Uh, Loz is shy. Look at this. Look at this. I oh, know. Getting back into my neck hair again. Fantastic. You've been very well behaved, Loz. You haven't you haven't had a go at the uh, at the headphones. Okay. Um, do you reckon that we? Do you reckon we can? Uh, do you reckon we're able to solve this biodiversity, the reduction of biodiversity issue in in urban situations? Um, should we like how 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 do we how should we frame the discussion going forward? Uh, I think it was really interesting where Jacinda said that we've sort of been hoodwinked uh, in the way the discussion is framed. And and I think she's 100% right there. But I don't often hear anybody saying that or dis or framing a discussion with that in mind when we talk about biodiversity in, in the urban setting. And I think that um, we, yeah, I, I think we don't often enough challenge people, and I mean challenge everyone. I don't just mean, I'm not, I don't mean challenge researchers. I think challenge everyone about what the perception of nature is and uh, how local it is. Naomi, I like the methods she used for her research. I'm amazed it hasn't been done that way before. Uh, but isn't that the way? Yeah, I, I mean, the way it's always been done before, in a way, reinforces the 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 perception of what is nature and also what is development. Once you see a logical way, it's hard to believe it wasn't done that way previously. Yeah. Um, look, I don't know, this is just opinion and supposition again from me, but I think a lot of times people think that if they did it, if they do it the old way, they're going to get more palatable results. I think, I think people are scared of finding out that things are actually pretty catastrophic. And I don't think anyone wants to have that discussion in the urban sense, because then we have to say, um, oh, good golly gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously I've got no skin in the, uh, in the game, but, you know, most people who are working professionals are property owners and a lot of them are property investors and that skews your perception. Um, uh, a lot of the a lot of the people who are doing research are actually working for companies that do um, uh, that advise developers. So um, I think there's a subconscious bias. And in some cases, I think the bias might not be subconscious. I think it might be a bias that people are prepared to accept uh, because, because they're, Employment depends on there being another developer and another development. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll see what we go. But yeah, Naomi, I think that is... Uh, um, now, I, 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 I do I, I do want to follow up with some of the work that Angie Haslam uh, has done. I mean, obviously, work 
on bats and lizards and frogs in the urban context, um, uh, vegetation communities. It all meshes together with the work that people are doing it, with birds. And yeah, birds are um, less difficult uh, to survey than some of the uh, some of the other uh, species of uh, vertebrates that are important. Um, we really didn't have as much time as I would have liked to have really gone through every part of the of the paper. It was really, really interesting. Um, but I think Jacinta is going to emerge as a um, as a real leader in this field in the next, you know, 10, 15 years. I think, you know, with Kylie Soans as well. Um, so, yeah. So, folks, you can throw up a com uh, anything you like. Um, did anyone see, actually, I'll see whether I can find it. Anyone see the article in, was it the Guardian or was it in the conversation about invasive species, feral, uh, feral species, um, that, uh, Oh, there's a ripper in the Guardian too. A couple of days ago, um, the crunch, the headline, the crunch, a widening, widening ideological divide, and the decline of birds. So we'll be getting into that. Um, uh, but there's a good one in BBC as well. Uh, a leading data scientist journey from doomism to climate hope. Um, uh, First time world exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit over a over a uh, uh, 12 month period. Uh, Indonesia's new capital city threatens stable proboscis monkey population. Uh, uh, then there's a whole lot of conflict stuff about green energy, wind turbines again. Um, uh, but I can't find the one that I want. Is this going to be the one? Let me see. Um, no. Um, anyway, I, people were saying that the, the article was just twaddle, infantile, tw infantile twaddle. So we might talk about that... Um, uh, looking up, see, Wednesday is going to be Valentine's Day. So thank you, Naomi. Naomi has already uh, sent me something about her bird, Valentine, the bird she loves. Uh, you can do that if you would like. The bird, um, uh, bird, bird, Valentine, the bird you love. Uh Naomi, interesting comment. I've often heard that overseas there's very little bird song in cities uh, and it's seeming that we're heading that way. I wonder, is it worth having city hubs with maximum density of humans surrounded by green areas that are national parks or something? Yeah. Oh, Naomi, I'm sorry you're feeling a little bit dejected. I feel this way all the time when I'm reviewing the literature just to prepare for the show. I mean, it's really, it's really hard to find... Uh, positive things because even when we have positive things like the floating wetlands it's on such a small scale that you know that the it uh, the good that it's done is outdone 500 or a thousand times just in the next development on the fringe of the uh, fringe of the city or uh, the the sort of Example I put in, I mean, at the moment in my street, there are still uh, two places that are under redevelopment and there's uh, another one for sale. And when that one is sold, I'm 100% sure that the mature trees will disappear. Um, Birdsong's an interesting one. 
I wonder if we didn't have cockatoos and corellas in my area, whether I would hear anything other than rainbow lorikeets, red wattle birds, noisy miners, and blackbirds, sparrows, and spotted doves, and common miners. I mean, that's the... That's the birds I hear. Oh, this morning, I must say, I I didn't get around to doing my first scene and heard this morning. But this morning, the first bird I heard was musk lorikeets. They were actually flying overhead before I heard any rainbow lorikeets. Now, that's really unusual to hear the musk lorikeets first. Um, but the first bird I saw, spotted dove, same old, same old. Um, mm hmm yeah, Naomi, I, I don't know. I mean, this is the issue about the planning and having city hubs and things like that. See, to, to do this kind of planning, you have to... To develop a city hub, that means you there's existing landowners and you need to do something like we did with Docklands in Melbourne where you have... You institute special planning laws, you give... Uh, a, a new authority, special powers to do things that aren't everywhere else and you constrain people's rights in terms of developing or transferring properties. And um, I mean, we, we've got a system where there are um, covenants that people can voluntarily put on property to protect vegetation and vegetation communities. Why don't we just let governments whack covenants onto people's properties? It doesn't... You can still sell it. You can still live in it. You, but you just can't change the fundamental nature of the vegetation that is on the property. We accept that for terrace houses and stuff. We accept covenants being put on for buildings and for streetscapes why don't we just why are we trying to reinvent the wheel why don't we just say this is important it's significant and you can't do that anymore like you can't knock down the front of a bunch of terrace houses i don't think you can take I don't think you can knock down the whole existing structure of terrace houses in parts of Melbourne where there's a historical overlay. Hell, you can't paint them certain colours. I think you can't build fences that are certain ways. Why don't we just say, no, you can't take the trees out. You can't scalp the block. I don't know. Anyway, I'll just get all, I'll just get all head up and upset again. But I think uh, I don't know why we always have to sort of reinvent the wheel, I, and I don't know why we have to. Um, uh, terrace houses are heritage listers here as well. Yeah, I think it's good. I don't know why we have to actually say we'll give someone we'll get if you already own a property that has greenery on it. It's already worth a lot of money. I don't know why why the rest of the community has to give you more money to stop being an environmental vandal. Um, I just don't I, I, I just don't accept that, you know. Um, uh, but I think that's the nature of of who we are as a community. Everyone everyone wants to get a present from the government uh, rather than just don't be a prick, right? When it comes to... And people... All, it goes to, back to this idea of we're custodians and all that. If you actually use that kind of terminology and you are reducing habitat, get stuffed. You're no kind of, you're no kind of uh, uh, custodian. Anyway, any more comments? I'm I'm boiling here. I can't believe can't believe we're dooming again. Uh, on Wednesday, 
which is Valentine's Day, which is, um, uh, here we go. Uh, McMansions are purported to be the bee's knees. People chase the Joneses. I think carrot and stick may help, Naomi says. Um, uh, I don't know. I could really get into this uh, again. In my experience, and when I've been helping people design gardens, when they've maybe first built, bought a block, um, and I've done this a lot where people have bought a block and then they'll bring me in their floor plan uh, with their garden and then want me to design like an irrigation and um, uh, maybe a the bare bones of a garden or maybe a complete garden. Most of the people I've spoken to, very few of them have got a really solid idea of the house they want to buy, uh, build. Most of them find a building company and then they buy a design that they can afford. So it's those... And often the building firms are allied to the developer that has sold the, the property. And that's what they're presented with because either they're easy to build or they're, uh, they're cheaper, to, cheaper to build. And I've got to say, unless I've been dealing with people who are not the norm, these are the people who feature on all of the housing, the, you know, Great, you know, what is it? Great, not great ideas, but grand designs and whatever the Australian copy is at the moment. And there's all these garden shows and whatever. The people that they're featuring with the beautifully designed mud brick place and with all the echo principles and everything, they're not first home buyers. They're not people who have just managed to scrape together the minimum deposit to buy the cheapest place on the cheapest block these are people who are already independently wealthy from from something and that's fine but the the really useful the really useful presentation should be on the the normal kind of house in the normal kind of development that can be done with the most minimal footprint possible. And, you know, the echo, the echo-friendly McMansion. I'd, I'd love a TV show that showed us the echo-friendly McMansion, but, uh, yeah, I don't think. And these are massive companies too that we, these development corporations, you know, they're n nationwide massive companies a lot of them are even though they're not public companies which is how we often think of it, multinationals being public companies a lot of these companies are private companies but are significantly um, have significant shareholder um, percentages that are from overseas um, so a lot of them are a lot of them are not. There is no thought about what's good for the local environment or even the local economy because these are not mum and dad, you know, local people investing in property and whatnot. And a lot of the building companies are not. And and so many of them are collapsing that they're not well run, obviously. They're not taking. They're not being prudent about risk. Uh, they're obviously thinking that things will go on being great forever. There's so many problems in building and in property. That is it. Any surprise that anyone gives a it that nobody is thinking about uh, biodiversity and environmental concerns and why and. I don't think I did a good job of presenting this to, to Jacinta, but I think those, if you're watching and you know what I'm regularly saying, we, the, 
the problem or the responsibility to fix the problem is continually pushed onto two places. Local councils, of course, and of course, nobody wants the local rates to go up because no that because of course we're all wasting it and look what all the people are wasting money on. So we push it onto local councils and then we push it onto the individual homeowner who needs to do the right thing with their garden. I agree. Good on see? Yeah, that's true. Oh, there he are. He's there we are. It's time for a bit of a dance. Good on you, Loz. There we are. Yeah, good on you, Loz. Um, okay, yeah, so here we go. So Naomi says, yeah, echo houses are expensive. That's right. So shouldn't we be making... I mean, if we're going to be giving money, public money to anyone, shouldn't we be giving it to people or to... We should make it that that's what you have to build. Um, uh, 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 they do eco-friendly mansions on grand designs occasionally, but the price, yeah. But see, they, but they're not they're not Joe Average houses, right? They're multi multi million dollar houses, and people put them on. Have a look at where they're built, you know. The one I watched the other day was these tiny little houses and on principles, but they're in the middle of a on the edge of a winery that is like a tourism venture winery. I mean, it's just crap. Um, uh, Chris will get to you in a minute. Uh, they do echo friendly. They're unrealistic for. Sorry, Naomi, I'm waffling. They do them in brackets, echo friendly mansions on grand designs occasionally, but the prices are exorbitant and totally unrealistic for average people. Absolutely. And Naomi goes on to say. And if you have a great plan for an echo house, uh, you have planning to go through and then some councils are not willing to consider unusual designs, mud brick, composting toilets, etc. cetera. Uh, and indeed, that it gets even harder in areas, Naomi, where if your infrastructure has been sold off, Often there are regulations, meaning you cannot bypass, you cannot choose to not connect, that you must connect. And then if you don't want to use that service, you've got to pay the ongoing service charges for something you don't want to use, and you've got to pay extra to have an alternative. So decisions that we took 20 or 30 years ago have taken away a lot of choices, the best choices that people could have made. Now, Chris says councils need to enforce the local laws they already have regarding protection of native vegetation and illegal removal. Uh, some are good at it, e.g. Banyul and Nilambic, but my shire is hopeless. Look, I would also say that even the good ones are not very good at it. Uh, they're, they're less bad than everywhere else. But the simple fact is that Councils don't want to do things that are unpopular because councillors need to be re-elected. Right? That's why rates don't go up. That's why councils don't... You know, what do most people who live in a council want? They want to be able to live in their house, have the services they want, and they want to be able to do whatever they want to do with their house. And they want the park to be nice and they want they want their bins to be collected and, you know, all that stuff. But they don't want a 15% increase in rates or a 17% increase in rates or a 25% increase in rates if that's what it requires to actually employ more people to do uh, surveying of existing vegetation and then to undertake enforcement. And what kind of enforcement can people do? They don't have the they don't have the power to do anything other than fine maybe I don't know, five five hundred bucks. It's probably hundred and twenty dollars or something. What I reckon it should be something like I mean, we used to value trees from Burnley in the urban uh spaces and some old 
you know, we're talking 50 to 70 year old eucalypts were being valued at a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. All right, if that's the value of a tree and someone's taken 20 trees, 20 eucalypts, mature eucalypts out of the backyard, fine them five hundred thousand dollars. And if that's a third of the value of their property, put a caveat on it. And when you sell it, you satisfy the debt. Um, oh no, that's taking away people's freedom. Um, okay, and Amy says, it'd be a great plan for an echo house. You have to go, yeah, okay, sorry, we went through that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. It's very difficult. It's actually very difficult to do the right thing. Uh, look at all the people now who have um, bought into the... Um, uh, bought into the tiny house movement, but then it's almost impossible to site a tiny house because you need to have the services if you're going to put it. You can have a tiny house if you keep moving, but if you want to have a tiny house and you've got a friend who's got 30 acres and says you can go and live down the back corner somewhere, council makes that very, very difficult in so many cases. Uh, Naomi says, yeah, rates do go up and they say for it's our own good. Um, uh, then they charge parking for visitors, $2. Yeah. But the reason they do that, Naomi, is that in most cases, they're restrained in how much they can put the rates up. Uh, a lot of councils are legislative, legislatively restrained in certain states for how much they can put rates up. So... Um, uh, yeah, so if if they are able to, if the only place they can do it is in things like the swimming pool and the parking meters and library fines and all that other stuff, that's what they do. Um, uh, yeah, and, oh, Lee, gee, we didn't even get into fire. You've made the point that, yeah, we have special allowances that... Um, uh, that allow people for fire, fire safety, you're allowed to do that. And then that's what people will do. They'll, they'll actually, I mean, I've spoken to people who have done this. They've, they've bought a place in somewhere in the city fringe and then they've cut everything down and then they say, oh, yeah, but it was for fire safety. And then if they get, if there's any thought of them being, uh, prosecuted they say but it was for fire safety and then they'll get like oh well we'll prosecute you here's a 150 dollar fine uh and naomi says my council has the highest rates anywhere in new south wales i think um i'd like to see us move i mean uh ash wednesday in melbourne 1983 uh, 1982 was it when i was in year 11 i think 1982 1983 and we're still um, not enforcing that people need to have some kind of mitigation strategy other than building, other than cutting down trees and clearing up leaf litter. I don't see anyone saying, yeah, everyone should, every home should have a sprinkler system um, because that would impinge on their freedom. Um, uh I'm just going to see if I can find out. Uh, sorry, everyone. I'm just going to... Uh, I've got a funny feeling that New South Wales is the same as Victoria. Um, okay, from what I can see here... Um, All right, here we go, New South Wales government. So there's an independent pricing and regulatory tribunal for special variations to increasing increase from rates above the rate peg. Okay. Um, now the... Uh, so the rate peg 
in New South Wales for 2023 to 2024 is 3.7%. So the starting point is a council can only put up their rates annually for that year, 3.7%. There is an allowance for the level of population growth, meaning some councils can put rate pegs up to 6.8%. Okay, so... Um, and some of them are much uh, are greater, like over... Over three years, Armadale is fifty eight point eight percent over three years. Bigger Shire, Bigger Valley Shire, forty eight point three. Canada Bay, thirty two point five over four years. Federation, seventy four point five nine over four years. Um, so they can't just put the rates up beyond that peg without saying, yes, but our population has exploded and we need this and we have other special reasons for doing it. But when you look at what was the inflation rate last year, I mean, is, wasn't everyone screaming about the prices going up 8%, 9%? So if your council is only able to increase rates by maybe 4 or 5%, their costs don't stop going up. So they go backwards. So they fundamentally must reduce uh, services. So there's no thought that they can increase the amount of people enforcing planning rules. Uh, so this is why I, I always, I know it's boring for a lot of people, but we need, to, we need to actually be a bit sophisticated about the analysis we do. If your council rates are going up, well, of course they are because everything else is going up. And if they want to maintain services, they need to put the rates up. And if your council area is under particular stress because for the previous 30 years it grew by 4% a year in terms of population, but because of the booming, you know, we've got a number, a whole lot of factors. Everyone says, oh, migration. But what about the fact that 40 years ago, most houses had three or four people living in them, but now it's two or three. Now, that's a 25% change. That means there's 25% more dwellings that people are living in. So, obviously, we need to go up. Um, uh, Armidale had corrupt councillors. They've also had a corrupt uh, uh, federal member um, They're trying to pay back the debt. Um uh, where does the corruption come from? Who drives the corruption? And in nearly 100% of cases, it's not the union of milk bar owners or the association of landscape contractors or, or the uh, tow truck driving fraternity who are dri driving corruption. It's property interests. It's developers and real estate agents. It's kickbacks for planning approvals. Corruption is linked directly back to the property in local uh, local councils. And councils set themselves up to always be property developers versus greenies. It's the easy way. It's the tried and tested way. Um we just need to be more sophisticated about this. Watch the news and see how they frame every corruption story in local government. Have a look at who the spokespeople are every time there is a discussion about the economy. Have a, just have a look at who they represent. Uh, have a look at the way the discussions about the builders going broke in Victoria and New South Wales. Have a look at how they're framed. And then think about who's pushing the buttons and who has the power in all of these conversations about about development. And then think back to why we're where we are. Anyway, I'm a great conspiracy theorist, but I don't think that the evidence ever proves me wrong. Um, and I still go back to the thing. If you are someone who... Um, uh, 
So here, here, Naomi, I think we, we got to have a look. I'd be happy with rate changes if they were within re- reasonable. Well, I think they are within reasonable. I mean, if you have a look at what the... Um, uh, it's actually sad rental properties are very expensive up here. Yeah, rental, exp- rental properties are expensive, but not because of council rates. Rental properties are expensive because it's very hard to to own a home and most of the people that are renting properties own several properties. They're not mum and dad investors. They're property tycoons. That's what what they have become. Uh, they're desperate people looking for houses. Yeah, absolutely. They've made, if they've made having a caravan out the back for rent, then I'd then it relieves some of the stress. Yeah, but then all your neighbours complain about people living in the backyard in a caravan. So we, we haven't got a system set up to let that happen. That would be a solution. But if you actually find someone who's got five acres and wants, and says you can put your caravan there and you're prepared to be like camping in a caravan there and that's how you choose your life, that's illegal. Most councils don't allow that to happen. You can stay there provided you get services taken to where you are. There's a septic tank or you're collected to sewerage or the power goes there. So there you go. Maybe it's thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to do that. Um, so he, here's the disconnect though. Yeah, in Victoria, it does seem better. Rules are better for granny flats. Yes, they are. But guess what? If you've got a backyard with five trees in it, but enough space for a granny flat, and you had to take the five trees out to put in a granny flat, okay, the granny flat helps. And actually, that's only good if someone other than the people who already live there are going to live in the granny flat. Right? So a lot of this is just, uh, look, I say it all the time, a lot of this is just bullshit. A lot of the times people put the granny flat in knowing that they then expand the market for who might buy the house when they sell it. Someone with an elderly parent. So a couple with an elderly elderly parent. They then become part of that market to buy the house when they sell it. But you can build the granny flat. That's great. But you're going to take in most cases, you're going to make take out a mature tree at least to put it in. So a lot of this is spin and a lot of this is Band-Aid stuff. And I don't think anyone can actually demonstrate how it will be better. And when you look at the people who are making the case for these, for these changes, often it's driven by the case put forward by the building industry or, uh, you know, the the whole allied industry. Um, if you put a granny flat in and you take two or three trees out, okay, so if you do that and there are three people living in, in the property now and you put the granny flat in and in two years' time, if you come around to the house and knock on the door and there are still three people living there, or maybe one of the three was a teenager and they're now no longer living there. So you've got a granny flat, but you've got 30% fewer people living there. Hasn't helped at all. So I think, I mean, here's me again. If I, if I was king, if I was the king... I would say you can get the special planning permission for the granny flat and do whatever you need to do. But in two years' time, you need to be able to prove that the granny flat has an occupant. Otherwise, you lose the benefit you got and you get penalised every year. Maybe your rates double. You get a penalty every year that there is not an extra person living on that in that address. Um, and this is the conflict, Naomi. Yeah, this is the conflict. This is the problem. 
throw their hands up in the air, got no idea what to do. Um, we just need to deal with these. Just do, do me a favour. Um, uh, just everyone who's watching and listening, because I know I go on the, this all the time, but next time you watch one of the lifestyle shows or the news or the morning show and they talk about, any of these new things about property development, new suburbs, housing design, anything at all, watch it with the question, who benefits from this? Where did the information come from? Who did they choose to interview? And just look at the framing of it. And also, while you're watching, just look at every time they talk about nature and include nature. And just see where they are when they talk about nature. Just see which wildlife park or whatever. I mean, they're not going out to interview Jacinta doing her research, are they? They're not going out on site to someone counting scarlet robins on the fringe of somewhere. They're going to the zoo or a wildlife park or SeaWorld or something. So... Just uh, and maybe maybe you can all start to be, you know, warriors for the cause by making people aware of the bullshit that we're spoon fed every day when any of these issues come up. Because um, there's great work being done out there, but do we really need someone? I mean, do we really doubt that? urban biodiversity is on the decline? Do, do we really think that that's a novel concept? I don't. Um, but then again, I could be completely wrong. Um, yeah. Anyone else got anything to, to say? Um, Loz is... Um, oh, there we are. What are you looking at up there? Loz is... Um, oh, he's having a scratch and looking at the ceiling. Very idea. Uh, Naomi, I'll just pop this up again because here, here's a, the here's a talk. The granny flat is just the latest thing. Two, what is it? Two or three years ago, we were talking about tiny houses. When I was in my 20s, it was all about mud brick and rammed earth. And, you know, I subscribed to earth garden and country living and everyone you know, have a chook. Have a ch have chooks in your backyard and getting into composting. These are all the things that are trotted out and it makes people feel good about what they're personally doing so that we don't actually need to confront the, the, the global problem. And the global problem is that the way we like to live is not sustainable. And if we don't change it, and I'm not talking about climate change and I'm not talking about emissions and everything let's just look at the very granular thing biodiversity in my street or my neighborhood um, I can tell you there's probably uh, uh, there's probably more birds here well, actually I would probably say that's probably right if I just went on the number of birds then here in my immediate location than 10 years ago. There's probably more birds, but I think there's less species. And there's certainly more of these. There's more rainbow lorikeets. There's certainly more spotted doves and there's more uh, sparrows. There's probably less blackbirds, maybe. Certainly more, more sulfur-crested cockatoos than when I first came here, but there's less galahs. Um, there's less masked lapwings. Um, subjective, of course. Um, but yeah. Okay, folks. Um, I really like Mondays when we talk urban birds, and I hope we can get someone as as interesting as uh, as just enter in for the next uh, uh, next iteration. I don't know who it's going to be next Monday. Um, uh, Wednesday, of course, Valentine's Day. Um, oh, Loz has just discovered my pocket. Oh, very good, Loz. Do you want? Do you want to go in there? Do you want to have a good look in there? Look. Hey, Loz. Look down here. Look. 
He'll have a look in a minute. Yeah, there we are. He's found the found the pocket. Uh, your bird, Valentine. Tell me your love story with a bird. Tell me the bird or birds. You don't have to pick one that you love. Why do you love them? What? Just tell us the love story, and we'll be doing that on Wednesday. Um, we'll take it from there. Last chance. Clock's ticking. Let's put the music on to fade out. Um, uh, let's put uh, let's put daydreaming on for now. Um, don't know what Loz is doing behind me, but it tickles. And you can let me know any further last comment. While we just chill out for a minute and think about the world that it could be. imagine just imagine a world with no further biodiversity loss and where property developers were beautiful people and that all of your local councillors had your well-being at heart I know ridiculous isn't it I know. Quite like this song. Why don't I play it more often? Yeah. All right. Daydreaming. Quite like this one. Um, so, yes. Don't forget. Do... Um, do send me your bird love story. Um, not fired up. Well, Naomi, that's the point. We need to dial down. Need to dial down the stress after we after we get into all of that. Um, don't worry. We we'll be fired up and angry again next Monday, no doubt, when we talk urban urban birds and. Uh, urban conservation again um, but, uh, you can send me your bird love story your bird valentine you can either email me as Naomi did grant at the bird emergency.com or I'll accept uh, I'll accept stuff if you send it to me on YouTube you can put in the comments or something on YouTube or you can send me a direct message on any of the socials just make it clear what you're um, sending it for because I don't always take a lot of notice of comments until I have a comment day um, unless it's made clear what the comment is for um, yeah, Loz likes my collar doesn't he I mean, don't you, don't you like this song? I'm just thinking this would be a good one just for background. I could bring the level down, have it about, about that loud and we could do it whenever we're just having a conversation. I think that's quite, quite good. Oh, would you like to know? Would you like to know the result of the Super Bowl? Now, this is going to date this stream. Because uh, I just got the breaking news. Oh, how great. I'm really glad that Taylor Swift was able to um, fly from Japan to the Super Bowl. Well, that's assuming she did. Actually, I should go through the headings. Uh, I'm sure there'll be something about Taylor Smith. Um, oh, I haven't seen anything yet about Taylor Swift. But the Kansas City Chiefs have won their third Super Bowl in five years with a 25-22 to 22 overtime victory. Um, uh, yeah. uh, there we are. I think I just told you who won. I'm going to see. I'm going to open up my news feed. And would we like to have a bet on whether one of the first five uh, stories mentions Taylor Swift at the Super Bowl? Let's have a look. 
Um, opening up now. Oh, Dr. Nick Bubukow uh, notification. I like it when I get one of those. Uh, live updates. Okay, I've got a Super Bowl update, but not mentioning Taylor Swift. But I do have... Um, Oh, no, that's bad news. I'm not even going to say that. That is bad news. Soaring stamp duty stings home buyers up to six times more than a generation ago. Now, Naomi, didn't someone mention something about stamp duty? See, nobody wants to pay it. And, and when stamp duty goes up to pay for stuff, it's terrible. It stings people more than a generation ago. Um, superannuation strategies to save you thousands. Um, popular teaching style, contrary to science, costing Australia forty billion. Re report finds. Um, oh God! I mean, these are a joke, aren't they? The working women's newest life hack: magic mushrooms. Um, uh, just having a look. No, well. Um, Uh, just having a look. Um, oh, oh! This will get me. This will get me angry. Uh, I've just seen a picture of a dodo in my feed. BBC Wildlife: The dodo is set to come back from extinction. Scientists are getting closer. Uh, dodo may return to Ma Mauritius. Genetic engineers are getting closer to res resurrecting this long extinct bird. But conservationists must prepare for its eventual reintroduction to its homeland. Um, all right, all right. We're going to do something just while I. Um, okay, so that's the big headline. Scientists are going to bring back the dodo and put it into back to uh, Mauritius. Um, uh, let me, I'm just going to do a search on an advanced search on the red list um, and we'll see what we do. So we want to go, uh, and I'm only going to do, only going to go birds and I'm going to say, Extinct in the wild, critically endangered and endangered. And are going to come down to uh, countries. Oh, no, here we go. We're going to go land regions. And we're going to go... Uh, where are we? Where's Africa? Uh Okay, Mauritius. Okay. And what is that asking me to do? Okay. Okay, so in Mauritius, um, I'll actually share this. I'm going to share this tab. Let's just see. This is why I think so much of this stuff is bullshit. Okay, here we go. Um... Hope you can see this. So this is Mauritius. Uh, birds, critically endangered, endangered or extinct in the wild. Uh, so the Mauritius Fodi population is stable. Uh, Barouse petrel, decreasing. Masquerine pet petrel, um, and that's critically endangered, decreasing. Madagascar fish, e fish eagle. Critically endangered, decreasing. Abbott's booby, stable. Sooty albatross, uh, endangered, decreasing. Uh, and then we have uh, more. The Mauritius kestrel, endangered, decreasing. Mellor's duck, decreasing, endangered. The Mauritius olive white eye, critically endangered, decreasing. Great knot, endangered. Decreasing. 
couldn't we just cut the bullshit about bringing back the dodo and um uh yeah uh Naomi, I didn't include extinct. I just put extinct in the wild. Uh, I didn't. Uh, we probably could have got more if we wanted to. But point being, why are we, why are we worrying about bringing back the dodo um, when we've got uh, one? Let's take the seabirds away. We got one, two, uh, three, four, five. We got five land birds there that are either endangered, critically endangered, or extinct in the wild. They could, apart from the seabirds, but just if you just took land birds, they could put all the resources into preserving those birds, and then when they're no longer decreasing, or they're increasing, and maybe habitat is not decreasing, then, by all means, bring back the dodo. I'll read. I'll read the whole article. Um, I'll just. I better save this. Yep, that might be what I do later in the day. Oh, what are you doing there, Loz? And we'll get into that later on. All right, folks. Um, now I am. Now I am going. Uh, now I am leaving. Um, thanks for being with me. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. The uh, sitting on my head is my. Avian Media Advisor, Loz. Uh, Loz has been... Uh, I think Loz thinks I've done a good job today because he hasn't been um, throwing a tantrum and he hasn't been destroying my headphones, which is another good thing. Um, we'll see you... Uh, well, hopefully on Wednesday when we talk about uh, our bird valentines. Please... Uh, Please send me your your suggestion. Be like Naomi. Send me your love story about a bird or the bird you love or your bird valentine. And you can take that concept, that idea, as broadly as you would like to. And we'll just have some fun talking about that. Um, otherwise, Habitat, but Habitat Gardening, Saturday morning, 9.30 Australian Eastern Daylight Time. And, of course, we'll be back next Monday talking urban birds. See you, everyone. I'm Grant, as it says down there. I'm a bird and I'm a plant nerd. See you later.